Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Randy McCaffrey. He is the co-founder of the Cannabis Care uh, Community Care and Research Network. And I'm going to have him take it away. Thanks. Hey everyone, <clears throat> thanks so much for being here. Um, I want to say thank you to Lester and Betsy, they're amazing, and to Peter and Liz for having us at their home, it was wonderful. Um, so um, now we have uh, Dr. Peter Grinspoon, MD, is the author of Free Refills, A Doctor Confronts His Addiction. He's a primary care physician at MGH in Boston, a former associate director for the Massachusetts Physician Health Service, and an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Gritspoon currently practices as a primary care physician at an inner city clinic in Boston and is on staff at Massachusetts General Hospital. He teaches medicine at Harvard Medical School. He spent two years as an associate director for the Physician Health Service, part of the Massachusetts Medical Society, working with physicians who suffer from substance use disorders. Dr. Gritspoon graduated with honors in philosophy from Swarthmore College. Before medical school, he spent five years as a campaign director at Green Peas working on the Nuclear Free Seas campaign. He attended medical school at Boston University, School of Medicine. His internship and residency were in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Today, he is proudly 10 years clean. He lives in Newton, Math, Mass, with his wife, Liz, and Spoon, and his blended family. So without any further ado, Dr. Peter Rainsville. everybody, thanks for coming. Thanks to Mary and Steve, Randy. Very excited to be here. Um, you know, it's interesting seeing my dad on, on screen. He does really well for 90 years old. Um, 90's old. <laughs> Maybe he's all the cannabis he's been smoking. Um, uh, who knows? Anyways, I've got um, obviously a lot of personal connections to this issue. One, growing up with my dad um, being a cannabis activist for so long, I've been involved in this issue in utero, um, you know, I'm a little bit tired of these stories, but I know they're very powerful and helpful for everybody else. You know, and I just remember, you know, this issue popping up everywhere. Um, going out to ice cream after dinner with my family at Emac and Bolios and having my dad get into a heated discussion with another physician, you know, who's like just savagely sort of attacking him about his position on cannabis. And my dad just enraging this other guy. You know, they're very collegial discussion, but. My dad just saying, well, it's actually more dangerous for an adult to drink a glass of whole milk than to smoke a joint of marijuana, and, which is actually technically true. And this other doctor is going berserk. <laughs> it just uh, did not compute. Um, and I also have another um, connection just because, um, and anybody knows a little bit more about my family, my older brother Danny, when I was eight, died of leukemia. And the only thing that kept him sort of uh, maintaining weight for the last couple of years was medical cannabis. Uh, we didn't have Zofran back then, and Composine wasn't working for him. He was on very intensive chemotherapy. And so I knew for a fact, firsthand witness, that medical cannabis works. And then I decided to become a doctor after being a philosophy major and working for Greenpeace and doing a bunch of other stuff. And I've, um, you know, just dealt with physicians who think medical cannabis doesn't work at all. And this has been a very bizarre experience because I know that it works. It's not a randomized controlled trial, but I actually saw it work in my own family. Like, in the same way that you drop an apple and it hits the ground, you know, you see the gravity work. So, you know, so I've been working on that with other physicians. I, I'm um, a board member of this group, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. We're really trying to reach out to other physicians. And, um, you know, this doctor that I work with in my clinic um, is a great doctor, a friend of mine, really compassionate primary care doctor, uh, great in the OP issue. He just said at a meeting about six years ago, you know, there's absolutely nothing we can treat with medical cannabis that we can't treat with other um, other medications. Uh, you know, completely, utterly against it. But of course, he's had me browbeating him for the last six years. And now he's a huge medical cannabis activist, and not activist, advocate, and he's gonna get certified and he refers patients to me all the time. So people can grow and change. I think part of the problem is, you know, if you grow up in a small county in the middle of the country and they only teach you that the earth is flat, you grow up as an adult and you think the earth is flat. And it's not entirely your fault. It's just the only thing you've been exposed to. And in medical schools, they only teach um, they only teach the endocannabinoid system, this whole neurotransmitter system, which is like profoundly important in the brain, in the immune system. It's how the cannabinoids, how cannabis works on the body. They only teach it in 13% of medical schools. I mean, this is really bizarre. And the stuff in our medical school textbooks 
was, you know, reads out of like a 1950s propaganda, um, propaganda book. So we really need to reach out to and educate physicians because it's really interesting. 90% of Americans are in favor of medical cannabis, but something like now, like something like 50 or 60% of physicians are in favor of it. So physicians are coming around, but they're way behind the patients. And it's been really interesting how patients are leading the charge on this. And I'm getting a little bit off, off topic, but they asked me to discuss where we have come and the clinical needs now for advancing medical cannabis and opiate addiction recovery and for end of life care. And you know, where we come, where we've been and where we come, you know, when I was a kid, you know, cannabis was flatly illegal. The medical uses were, were hardly recognized at all. Um, and it was so widely stigmatized. And we had the government and these advocacy groups like Partnership for Drug Free America, they were just going amok with these anti-cannabis propaganda campaigns. And now, you know, prohibition is still a really, really big fight and a lot of challenges remain, which I'll discuss if we have time. But um, it's pretty remarkable that we're here um, discussing, uh, you know, opening access for veterans. Um, we're here talking about making Massachusetts a research hub, hopefully for the whole world. And that I'm in my clinic allowed to certify patients and treat patients with it. So on the one hand, we should have been able to do all that all along. And it's a whole complicated sort of history about why we haven't been able to do that. But on the other hand, it's really amazing what progress we're making. So it is really a brave new world now that I'm really excited to be a part of. Um, and, you know, I personally have a third um, connection to this person is that I'm in, I am in recovery from opiate addiction. And that's why I got involved from, um, with physician health services and helping other um, physicians with um, addiction. And uh, I think the cannabis does have a phenomenally large role to play in addressing our current opiate addiction. And that's, it's starting to be recognized. Three states actually have exchange programs where you could take your um, Illinois and a couple others. You could take your opiate, your um, prescription and exchange it for cannabis prescription, which is really intelligent. Um, there are a bunch of ways where it unquestionably can help with the opiate crisis. Um, you could use it as a painkiller instead of opiates. You can use it to transition people off of opiates, or you could use it to lower people's dose of opiates. They've seen that uh, you could lower, people need about 20% of the dose of opiates if they co-use it with cannabis because they work on the same receptors. Um, and given that a lot of the um, trouble you get into with opiates, overdoses and so forth are dose related, if you could cut the dose down by 80%, that's really phenomenal. Um, the other ways are, it is really good for withdrawal symptoms um, if someone's coming off of opiates. And a lot of the addiction people are like, well, look, there's no evidence of that. And it's like anybody who's ever used it for withdrawal symptoms can tell you that it works. And then, but you can't study it. They're like, well, it's unethical to study it. Well, you can't say that there's no evidence and it's unethical to study it. It's like, so what are we supposed to do? And everybody says that it works. So they sort of put you in a box. It's a little bit complicated. Um, I find the addiction psychiatrists are sort of the, the biggest fashion of um, resistors in terms of coming around to medical cannabis. Um, not all of them, but just in general. The other people are the pain, the pain specialists because they love to give injections. So they hate medical cannabis because they do their business. You know, as Upton Sinclair said, it's very hard to get someone to understand something if their income depends on not understanding it. Um, I'm probably butchering the quote. But the addiction psychiatrists are, are, are very dif difficult. Um, but, you know, a new study came out which is making some of them change their minds. Um, and it's really interesting to see uh, people who can change their minds in addition to, you know, kind of with the, and incorporate new data versus people who kind of stick to the drug war mentalities. It's really fascinating to me to see that. But this study that came out is pretty revolutionary. I'm not going to bore you guys with slides with a lot of studies. There are only three studies that I'm going to cite. And it says that high intensity cannabis use is associated it with retention in opiate agonist treatment, a longitudinal analysis. And the conclusion was that among people who use illicit drugs, initiating opiate agonist treatment, you know, like suboxone, buprenorphine, to get off heroin or fentanyl, um, at least daily cannabis use was associated with approximately 21% greater odds of retention in treatment compared with less than daily cannabis consumption. So, you know, they were kicking people out of suboxone programs for testing positive for cannabis. I said, why do we even test for cannabis? At Boston Medical Center, we don't test for cannabis. Why do we test for cannabis at, at MGH? And they got rid of the THC um, in some of the drugs, not in all of them. But here, actually, 
you could argue you should test for cannabis to see that they're taking it because it increases their uh, retention. And you know, a couple, of the, a couple of the addiction people actually said, I'm gonna get certified. So they actually went from being drug warriors to being agnostic. Now they're gonna get certified to potentially prescribe cannabis. That's really open-minded, I was really impressed. And then others are still like digging in, you know, the evil weed, you take a puff, your legs fall off. So there's a wide <laughs> spectrum of sort of a, ability to be open-minded on this issue. It's really, it's really pretty amazing. Um, the final issue with addiction and, and cannabis is very controversial. It's whether or not you could use cannabis as medication-assisted therapy instead of methadone or suboxone or Vivitrol, whether you could use cannabis. I don't recommend that people do that just because it's a little bit risky. Uh, if I treat someone with a migraine and it doesn't work with cannabis, they get a migraine. So I try something else. But if I try to treat them for addiction and it doesn't work, they get overdose and die. So until there's more evidence, I don't recommend that for people. And that was one of the indications in some of the exchange programs, cannabis for opiates, and that got very heavily criticized. Now, they need to study this, and there's no ethical way to study this. So I don't know how they're going to establish this. And a lot of patients are using it. So you're sort of in the dilemma where patients are using it. You don't want to discourage them if they're using it because who wouldn't want to be in cannabis rather than suboxone or methadone? It's safer, and you don't have to you know, get drug tested all the time, see your doctor every week, be treated like a criminal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, you don't really want to recommend it because it's, there's no data and if something bad happens, you feel really bad. So um, we're in a little bit of a dilemma about that particular indication. I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years, this were one of the medications we're using to get people off heroin. But right now it's a little bit iffy sort of recommending it. So um, people ask me and I just say, I can't really recommend it. A lot of people use it. A lot of people have reported success. It certainly helps with withdrawal symptoms. I can tell you personally, when I was getting off opiates, it helped me a ton with withdrawal symptoms, not way more than any of the hyped up pharmaceuticals that they have approved for, but for actual substitution, you can't quite recommend it yet. Sorry, I have a big sign in my office that says, without caffeine, I have no personality whatsoever. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, people say, see, alcohol speaking for me, it's a caffeine speaking. Um, and then finally, in terms of end of life care, these are all like really long subjects, so I'm kind of going over briefly, but um, end of life care is sort of the most obvious indication for cannabis because A, if you want to argue there are long-term consequences, who cares, it's end of life care. And second of all, <laughs> the symptoms that you're using are the obvious symptoms that cannabis treats, not sort of the controversial symptoms, but you know, um, intractable nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy or radiotherapy, weight loss, anorexia, cachexia, severe intractable pain, um, mood, anxiety, and insomnia. And so not only have they been finding with um, palliative care um, that cannabis is really, really effective for these things, it also, most importantly, decreases the number of some medications used by this patient population. That's sort of an understatement. They, it decreases a lot of the medications they use, and most importantly, it decreases the opiates. So in their precious last few lives, uh, last few months of life, instead of being like zonked out on morphine and fentanyl, they're like more conscious to spend meaningful time with their family. It's really a gift for them to be able to use cannabis. And the main obstacle to this is the physicians who aren't educated about it. So that's why we have a lot of work to do educating the physicians on the benefits of cannabis. Um, you know, is it safe in the elderly? A study came out from Israel um, with 2,736 patients above 65 years of age, and um, they used it for pain and for cancer. And it was really pretty amazing. Um, the reported pain level was reduced from a median of eight on a scale of eight to 10 to a median of four. I mean, that's amazing for pain. And the most, uh, there are very few side effects, 9% reported dizziness. And after six months, 18.1% stopped using opiate analgesics or reduced their dose. So not only can it help with the opiate crisis in general, but for elderly people, they fall, they get delirium, opiate, they get constipated. This sounds like not a big deal, but for elderly people, that's like a disaster. Um, Cause they're sort of constipated anyway. So they end up in the emergency room. So, you know, it's very safe in the elderly. And then specifically with uh, palliative care, uh, there's another study out of Israel. Again, Israel, Canada, uh, Europe, they're studying it. And we have these preposterous restrictions in this country, which hopefully will be lifted when we get a change of administration or if the Democrats are able to push something through. But this other study came out of Israel. And it was specifically studying um, 
palliative care for cancer patients. It was studied breast, pancreatic, colorectal, and lung cancer patients. Um, the median age was 60 years old, and they found that 95.9% of patients treated with medical cannabis for palliative care reasons reported um, an improvement in the condition. Like 95.9%, that's unbelievable. Show me any medical treatment where 95.9% .9 of people show an improvement in their condition. And um, the conclusion was that cannab cannabis is a palliative care treatment um, seemed to be well-tolerated, effective, and safe option to help patients cope with malignancy-related symptoms. So I just think we're really behind. We have this, this treatment that's like really under, like profoundly underutilized. And you know, we're really in a brave new world in the sense that A, we now have access to it for patients that we didn't before. And B, in terms of research, um, which I'm really excited about this, this new group because we're gonna be funneling a lot of research in Massachusetts we're in a brave new world of what these different cannabinoids can do. Um, we, uh, you know, over during prohibition, the cannabis was um, bred to be very high in THC, which is great if you want to get high, write a book, go dancing, or go to a party, or paint. But for medical uses, now they're starting to breed back the different cannabinoids, like, you no know, CBD, everybody knows about. I'm not going to talk about that. But like THCB is very exciting, a possibility for controlling appetite weight loss and diabetes, like 80% of Americans are overweight and diabetes is epidemic. And if we have, you know, a cannabinoid that can lower weight and control blood sugar, that's revolutionary. That's infinite in terms of healthcare savings and human misery. So um, I think it's really, we're just at the beginning of a brave new world. Um, as we start teaching doctors about the endocannabinoid system, you know, young doctors, medical students and residents are writing op-eds and they're clamoring for more education. So I really think that's going to start to change. Um, obstacles remain. I mean, it's legal in Massachusetts, both medically and recreationally, but there are still 40 states where adult use marijuana is illegal and people are still getting arrested. The arrests are still racially disproportionate. People are going to prison and there are still about 15 states that don't even have medical access. And even in Massachusetts where you have medical access, a lot of my patients can't afford it. Like I'm in Chelsea. Uh, insurance isn't paid for it. So I finally certify someone and they come back and they say, hey, it worked great, but how am I supposed to afford $100 a month for for the, these drops? It's just absolutely impossible. So there are still a lot of um, a lot of obstacles. You know, what we're working on today is veterans still don't have access to it, which is a disaster. I mean, I see a lot of veterans in my primary care practice just because they get the cold shoulder from the VA, which is completely ridiculous. But I know we're going to talk more about that. Um, and, you know, other challenges are the sort of the corporatization of the medical cannabis um, industry. I know Shaleen Title is here and she works on that. Um, it's really interesting. It just seems to be losing some of its, um, some of its flavor, the, you know, fighting for 40 years to legalize cannabis. And then people come in from the tobacco and alcohol industry and sort of take over. And they say the right things about wellness, but they don't seem to really care that much about social justice and um fixing the wrongs of the past so it is really complicated and there the at the prohibition movement is still very active people are acting like legalization is a fait accompli but there's still a huge fight going on across the board at every single level so i just don't want people to become complacent um i could talk about that maybe during the panel but um people are talking the latest thing is people are talking about old versus new cannabis they're like Oh, well, the old cannabis isn't that dangerous because there's only 3% THC. But now the new cannabis, which is 20% THC, is really dangerous. I'm like, it's the same thing. It's just stronger. You actually have to smoke less to get high. They're like, no, but it's stronger. It's new cannabis. I'm like, so scotch is more dangerous than beer because it's more concentrated, but it's the same molecule. They're like, it's new cannabis. I was just reading this debate that they had in the Marshall Project. And, you know... I'm, I'm thinking of writing an editorial, like new cannabis means THCV and CBD and all these new medical treatments. New cannabis is a good thing. It's exciting. It's not just more red meat for prohibitionists. It's total uh, BS. So anyways, we have a lot of work to do. I'm over my time. I don't want to get shot uh, by the powers of be. So thank you for listening.